Hey, that's a great start where I forgot to hit the mute button because my kids were being loud right before I went live. So that's how this day is going to go. Uh, well, we can only get better from here. Uh, so quick housekeeping reminder uh, with the online chat, um, make sure that it is staying on topic uh, and then no politics, no religion. Uh, we just we want to keep this uh, focus on information security and the CISSP. So uh, last week, we got through introduction, first domain, security and risk management. Um, everything goes fast. We was updating the slides from last year and realized that we were doing, we missed the NCAAs and we had snow and we were able to get out and do stuff and that just made me sad. So anyway, here we go. All right, uh, if you haven't signed up for the study group, you can register, there's the link. Um, you'll see that. Uh, in the slides and we'll send that out as well in those daily emails. All right, so I wanna take a little more time uh, talk about risk analysis, uh, things you have to understand. Um, things on these slides, remember them. Assets, that's your hardware, your software, your information, your vulnerabilities or weaknesses, what the threat to those assets are. So a vulnerability is the weakness around that. Uh, and then what is risk? Risk is your threat times your vulnerability, the likelihood and impact. You've got to know that. Um, and when you're taking this exam, if you see an answer that says uh, human life or protecting life, that's your answer. That's a freebie question right there. So anytime you get through this and, and you see uh, protect human life or that that's one of the answers, that's going to be uh, the priority there. All right. Well, uh, let me turn this up a little bit here. Hang on, I apologize. Let's see if I can get back to it. All right, Let's see if we can uh, go. If that makes it any better, let me know. Make sure that that's going. There's a little delay here, so I apologize for that. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, moderators, if you can tell me if that sounds better, let me know. All right, so we wanna talk about the qualitative versus a quantitative uh, risk assessment. Uh, differences, qualitative is uh, opinion-based. Quantitative is values, so quantitative quantity. Uh, you're gonna be looking at what is an actual quantity of something. All right, there we go. Looks like I fixed that. Um, and here you have a risk likelihood matrix. Uh, so when you're looking at what's the probability and the impact, um, you know, you're assigning uh, uh, values to each of these minor, low is a one, and then all the way up to a severe is 25. So it kind of works as, as a way to understand what that uh, qualitative, or sorry, quantitative um, looks like. All right, so quantitative based on the real values, right? Uh, Asset value, you got to consider what's the fair market value for an asset. Typically in these exams, what you'll get is they will tell you what that asset value is. You won't have to figure it out. They're going to tell you that. Um, your exposure factor is what would happen uh, if you had an incident. So what percent of your asset is lost during an incident? Again, they're going to tell you what that is. Your single loss expectancy is the um, value of your assets times your exposure factor. And again, so you'll have, you may have to figure that out, uh, but they're going to give you the information you need to uh, figure that out. And then your annual rate of occurrence. How many times is this going to happen a year? Again, they're going to tell you that. They're going to give you that in the exam. Um, and then your annualized loss expectancy is the uh, single loss expectancy times your annual rate of occurrence. So how many times a year do you think this is going to happen? And how much is it going to cost each time it happens? When you're doing this, if your annualized loss expectancy exceeds the total cost of ownership, that's uh, a positive return on your investment. Okay. So when you're looking at this and we're going to go through some uh, questions here and it'll, uh, you know, help explain it. But what you want to do is never spend more on a solution than the risk is actually presenting to the organization. Uh, at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. 
if our annual loss expect annualized loss expectancy is you know a hundred thousand dollars and the solution to prevent this from ever happening is hundred and twenty thousand dollars that's not a good spend okay so risk choices there are only four you have to do but you need to make a risk decision you can't just say well i didn't know right um, you can accept that risk it's fine document that you've accepted the risk. At least you've done a risk assessment and said, yes, we understand this is a risk and we're accepting it and here's why. Uh, we're gonna mitigate that risk or you know, remediate it where we found, yeah, we gotta fix this. Uh, transfer it to a third party, uh, you know, a um, COLA location, your cyber insurance, and things like that, or we're gonna avoid the risk. We're just not gonna do whatever that activity is that was presenting the risk. Come on, having issues. All right, lots of risk management processes. 830 from the NIST, um, nine step process. Just understand at the high level what you need to do here. All right, we need to understand what the system does. We have to identify our threats. We have to identify our vulnerabilities. What do we have in place already? What's the likelihood of these things happening? What's the impact if they do happen? What's our risk? Uh, exposure at that point, what are we going to do to fix it or mitigate or whatever, whatever the uh, risk action is, and then we're going to document those um, results. Straightforward, easy. All right, so quizzes, you will notice as we're not in the, uh, the uh, uh, slide deck that was sent out earlier, I'm not going to give you guys that much of a, a head start. So uh, which of the following would be an example of a policy statement? So as you're looking through these, uh, you will need to know the differences in this. And hopefully you can remember what a policy was, uh, you know, high level guidance, right? So with that, we look at these questions and we're gonna, I'm gonna talk through how I would answer these questions uh, if I were taking the exam. So we wanna look at non-specifics. We need to look at, at higher level uh, overarching statements. So changes with significant potential impact or significant complexity must have usability, security, impact testing, and back out plans included in change documentation. I kind of like that one. It just gives you some guidelines and saying, hey, you got to have these things in place. Now, I'm going to keep that one on the list. Uh, wireless devices must use TKIP or AES with 128. Well, you know what? Uh, to me, I'm going to go, no, that's more of a standard, right? We're, we're giving explicits around what needs to be done. Policies shouldn't be changed often. If the, something happens with TKIP or AES and we need to make that change, we would have to reapply all of our policies. I'm going to write, strike that one out. Uh, strong password by choosing the first letter of each word in a sentence and mixing in numbers and symbols, maybe. Uh, standard crypto period lifespan of an encryption key is one year. Uh, again, it's too prescriptive. Um, for me. So to me, I'm down to A or C, uh, knowing what it is, um, C being more of a guideline on how you can choose a strong password. So the answer is A on that. And this is very strange, I'll be honest, uh, not being able to see any of the responses as we go. So hopefully this is helpful and I'm not going too fast. Okay, when we talked about this uh, last time, evidence, and what, what does it have to be? Well, Real, relevant, real, accurate, complete, or direct, authentic, accurate, direct, relevant, real, relevant, authentic, accurate, complete, convincing. Well, I know convincing wasn't on there, so I'm going to immediately knock that one out. Or is it? I don't know. All right, see, so now we start wondering what, what's going on. Uh, real, direct, circumstantial, corroborative, or hearsay. Well, I can tell you right now, D, that's the types of evidence. It's not what it must be. So I, can, I know that one's not the case. So now I gotta go back and look and see and figure out which one of these really it is. And it is in fact C, I, I looked at the answer and that's why I said it's not that one, it got on my head, but there you go, good start. All right, so here is what we were talking about with the um, rate of occurrences and annualized loss expectancy. So huge tip for you all on taking this exam. Um, when you're doing this, when you see a big 
paragraph up here, don't read it. Save yourself the time. Go and look at what the question is actually asking. Then go find that in that paragraph. Okay. So in this case, what is the annual rate of occurrence in the above scenario? Well, when I start looking at this, I don't care that they make iPads on, or iPods online. I don't care what it, the cost is. What's the average week? I don't care. That's not the matter. That doesn't help anything because that's not my rate of occurrence. Uh, you suffer 14 DOS attacks on average per month. Well, there's your, that's your annual rate of occurrence. I'm sorry, uh, per year. So 14, that's our answer right there. Maybe there it goes. Okay. Same thing. And you'll see this a lot in the exam. Again, uh, they're going to use the same scenario and then ask a different question off of it. So same thing. We're going to skip right down. What is the annualized loss expectancy? of lost iPad sales due to the DOS attacks. All right, well, now we gotta go and say, we make $40,000 per week, and we have uh, sales of losses of 20%. Oh man, what was annualized loss expectancy? Well, you could take that uh, 40,000 times uh, 0.2, and then multiply that by 12. That's going to give you your annualized loss expectancy of 112,000. That's what we expect to lose over the course of the year due to these DOS attacks. All right, same thing. We're now getting the exact same scenario for a with a third question. Now it's asking, is the DOS mitigation service a good investment? Well, we've got to remember we just figured out the annualized loss expectancy. Uh, is 112,000. So we're saying it's gonna be 12,000 a month for the subscription, which would come out to be 144,000 for the year. Well, no, it's gonna cost more to prevent this from happening than just letting it happen. That's not a good um, solution. So no, total cost of ownership is higher than the annualized loss expectancy. All right. Attacker sees a building protected by video cameras and attacks a building next door with no video cameras. What control combination are the video cameras? And this is always one that you have to pay attention to what they're asking uh, when you're looking at these. Because again, you could have multiple different types of uh, control combinations here. In this case, it's a physical, it's a video camera, it's physical, and it's a deterrent. The criminal saw the camera and went somewhere else. Physical deterrent. In this one, we're looking at video cameras to investigate theft of computer supplies. Oh, well, we've identified an issue. So what control is, is it at that point? Well, it's still be physical, but now it's going to be a detective control. All right, last one. Uh, which of the following is not a canon of IFC squared? Remember, those canons are going to be very, very testable and in the correct order. So you're going to definitely need to know, looking at this right away, oh, there you go. That's not, that's not it. We can protect society. We can provide diligent and competent services. We can advance the, uh, and protect the, the profession. We got to know this is about as, again, this in human life, uh, about as close to gimme's as you're going to get. Here we go. Piece of cake. Let me just make sure on the chat, everything is looking good. I don't have any messages. All right. So now we're going to talk about uh, asset security and protecting this, uh, the, the security of those assets. And it, it's a really, yeah, easy, easy in theory, very difficult in practice, easy to understand what we're going to talk about. Actually implementing these in the real world, totally different story. All right. So this is a very short chapter. Um, what we're going to talk about is how do we classify data, ownership of that data, uh, memory remnants, data destruction, and data security controls. Here are your terms and definitions to memorize. Absolutely do want to go through these and understand them. I'm not going to read them off to you, but you will need to know all of these things in orange and what they mean for the exam. All right, so when we're looking at classifying data, uh, when you have labels, objects have labels, subjects have clearances. We're going to go through this a little bit uh, more here, but you know the, the way to look at it is that you, you have information that maybe is uh, top secret 
right? It's, it is a top secret for a government one. And then the clearance is what level of clearance do you have? Do you have, uh, you know, secret, top secret, whatever. So you have an object that has a label and then people or subjects have clearances to access objects within uh, that level. Uh, typically for the company private sector, uh, you have confidential, internal, and public. We want to keep these as simple as we can. Uh, you don't need to have more than usually three, maybe four um, of those uh, uh, labels for that. Um, when you do it, you do need to have formal authorization and approval uh, for uh, for the information. You know, not really used as much in private. It's really more Department of Defense, uh, government um, to get this on in, in place uh, for the for that. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So formal access approval. What does that mean? Well, it means it's documented, right? Whatever that is, is it a help desk ticket? Is it, you know, you submit an email, whatever that is, there needs to be a documented uh, a request. The requests need to be approved by the owner, um, not the manager, not the custodian. We'll talk about that here in a second. The, they then are approved, the subject, whoever made that request, uh, to access certain objects. And then the subject has to understand all the rules and requirements for the access. Um, and then, yeah, you got to audit them. So what does that really mean? Uh, you've got, I need to send in an, a request if I want access to data. Whoever the data owner is needs to approve that access. Then the custodian would uh, grant the access. And whoever is being granted access needs to understand what does that mean. If I'm being granted access to confidential information, I need to know what does that mean? What does having confidential information mean? All right, so uh, three roles, data owner, custodian, and data user. Uh, data owner, that's whoever is responsible for the data. We're gonna talk through this again in the next few slides. Data custodian is typically more IT, and data user is the end user. Uh, looking at those three classifications of confidential, internal, and public, what do those mean? We're gonna go through those here in a bit. Uh, again, really easy to document to say, hey, this is what is considered confidential or an internal use uh, document. Actually getting that stuff implemented where you have all the documents labeled correctly, very, very different. I don't know if anyone's ever done that before or tried to, but yeah, it's a, it's a mess. All right, so what is a data owner? You will need to know what those three roles are. Uh, that's the person that's going to be re responsible for that data, right? How is it? How do we get it? How do we? How can it be sent, stored? Uh, they're going to set the uh, value and classification of that, right? So we're going to go through it here in a second with custodian being IT, but the data owner is the one who should be saying, "Hey, this is confidential information. Here's our backup requirements for this. Uh, here's how we must protect it from an encryption standpoint. Those types of things." And then the data custodian is going to be the one implementing the controls to protect that information. So there's our data custodian. Um, like I said, it's typically an IT. They're the ones that are going to go in and actually add someone to a user group that gives them access to a folder. They're the ones that are going to be setting up the backups or you know doing the different configurations um, for that. Many cases, the data owner isn't the one uh, dictating how the encryption or the backup schedule or anything like that goes. It's typically uh, what we see is IT saying, here's what we're going to do. It's not technically the correct way to do it, though. And then the data user is um, whatever interacts with that data, right? So you could have a data user typically being a person. However, it could be maybe it's a script, right? They're going to export things and move things around through a script. That would be considered a data user. All right, so confidential information or confidential data, it's any information protected by statutes, regula regulations, company policies, or contractual language. Uh, a data owner may also designate the data as confidential. So what that means is we've got certain things, PHI, 
um, you know, PCI data, card data, uh, things like that, that that we have to keep confidential. Uh, anything from a regulatory or contractual standpoint as well. Uh, but also a data owner could just say, hey, you know what? This is confidential. This is need to know only. Maybe uh, HR files or uh, you know things like that. Uh, some merger acquisition type of thing could be labeled confidential. And confidential, very sensitive. The way I look at it, if confidential data got out, it would be a harm to the organization. There's negative... Uh, very negative impact to it. So PHI, social security numbers, any of those things get out, that's, that's a bad day. We don't want that happening. That is what is considered uh, confidential data. Uh, what are the minimum protections you need to know? And these need to be defined uh, within the organization. So this is some examples of this. Uh, it has to be protected with a minimum level of authentication. It has to be uh, in a locked drawer, has to have strong encryption. See the encryption policy, which would then reference um, some encryption standards around that as well. Uh, again, some more examples. Uh, this is out of um, some policy templates that we have. Uh, so, you know, how do you protect it? I love the fact that we still have to send via fax. Thank you, healthcare. Um, seems to be the only thing that still is using that, but they consider it still uh, secure and it is what it is. How do you previously establish and use to dress? Uh, well, I guess you send a test fax and ask the person to read you what they sent. There you go. Uh, anyway, so just some samples on that. Uh, again, if you're protecting data, uh, confidential data, we have to have a notification process for our information security committee if it's been lost. All right, why is that? Well, because we need to get ahead of it. If this is a potential breach or an incident, we need to know about it and be ahead of the game. Uh, minimum labeling, again, you need to have, this is all samples, but good examples of what this should look like. Define exactly what that means. How do I know as a user or a data owner or anybody interacting with that data, how do I know what the classification is? Well, we're gonna define it and it's gonna be the exact same on everything uh, we do. So internal data, the way I look at this is, um, it, it would be embarrassing for the organization, but there's really no negative you know, business impact, right? We're not looking to be facing fines or lawsuits. Uh, it's just going to be more embarrassing um, and kind of a black eye to the organization if that were to get out. So again, we're going to define what are those minimum protection requirements. Like these are all samples. Uh, again, with uh, us having put these together, I do think they are pretty good. Uh, it is important there, that last bullet point, it's the default classification if one has not ex been explicitly defined. The reason we say that is, right, on this next page, we've mentioned, hey, if it's internal, it's got to be marked in blue and bold and down at the footer. We said if it's uh, confidential, it's red and in the bold. Uh, if I don't see anything at all, what do I do? Well, I just have to assume it's internal. It means I can't be sharing it with people outside the organization. I just got to be careful with it, but I don't have quite the same restrictions as I do uh, with confidential data. And then public data, this is what's going to be um, publicly available. This could be uh, things on the website. Uh, this could be um, job postings, press releases, all those types of things. Same thing. We don't have really any protection requirements for public data. It's public. It's out there. There's nothing. That's the whole point of it. Um, again, we should be marking it as public uh, just so that we know uh, if it's going to be what the protection requirements are. All right. So again, what is the ownership? Who are the types of owners for data? Uh, you, could, you, you will need to know what business owners, data owners, system owners. Um, we need to uh, document the responsibilities of those uh, owners and they have to be trained and we have to have segregation of duties. So uh, data owners, uh, business owners, business processes, data owners, the actual data, system owners, the uh, applications. It's an easy way to kind of think of those three things. 
Uh, so data controllers and data processors. Again, you're going to have to know these as well. And in case you couldn't tell, there's going to be a lot of memorization. So I hope you're ready. Uh, data controllers, they're going to be creating and managing the data. Data processors manage the data on behalf of the controllers. So a data controller creates it, the processor manages it. That's it. Really what you're going to see is you're not going to see anything a whole lot different, uh, deeper than that. If you can remember the, what's on this slide, you should be able to figure out, looking at what the question is, what are they asking? Are they looking for a data controller or a data processor? Um, again, data collection limits, you really should only collect what is absolutely necessary. Uh, right now, you've got you know GDPR and CCPA and all these different privacy uh, regulations going into place. Just make your life easy. When you're going to go collect data, ask yourself, do I really need this and what am I using it for? If you need it and you have justification, just document what you're doing. There you go. All right. So now we're going to shift gears and I am going to check to make sure there's no uh, questions on here to make sure we're all good. I don't see any, so I'm going to move forward. Oh, a joke. Uh, I forgot this was in here. Um, did you guys know that milk is the fastest liquid on earth? It's pasteurized before you ever, ever see it. This is really weird because I don't have any feedback. I need like a, a laugh uh, soundtrack for this. All right. Moving on. Uh, memory, remnant, and remnants. We will need to know all these things, and you will need to know the different levels. Um, you're going to need to know where they reside and what they can do, uh, and all the definitions. So, memory, cache memory is your fastest, closest to the CPU. You'll need to know what a register file is. Um, you'll need to know L1, L2 cache, and SRAM. You'll need to know that order. So, just remember, cache memory is going to be your fastest closest to the CPU, and then it's made up of that register file, the L1, L2, and SRAM. We're gonna talk through that here in a second. So uh, RAM is your random access memory. So that's what you see in that picture there, is what goes, uh, you know, the older uh, stuff. You have DRAM and then SRAM. So uh, you gotta remember, it's, it's volatile, right? So what's gonna happen on this? You're gonna have to memorize all this stuff, just, just so everybody's clear. Uh, you're going to hear me say that on almost all these slides. So what they're going to tell you in the exam is they're going to give you an example uh, that says, uh, you know, you have an, a uh, memory that's using flip-flops. What type of memory is this? And they're going to give you ex uh, the different acronyms. Or they'll spell it out. I don't remember exactly which one it is, but either way, you'll need to know that. That, hey, flip-flops is SRAM, right? Or they're going to say uh, you need something that's slower and cheaper uh, that's using capacitors. Or, hey, this is what gets installed on a motherboard, right? So you're going to need to know all the different things that you see uh, on this slide and be able to tell the difference between them. Guess what? More memorization. Same thing. You're going to have to understand what these are. So programmable read-only memory, it's written once by the manufacturer, right? That's what's going to come in a device that just does whatever it's supposed to do. Uh, EEPROM erasable, so you can flash this. That's typically ultraviolet. That's uh, not something that, that you do at home. Uh, EEPROM, electrically erasable, programmable, so you can do a, a flash on that. And then programmable logic device, so um, you got to know PLD, all those three, the PROM, EEPROM, EEPROM fall under PLD. So, you know, I wish I had a little more tips or tricks for you on this one, but again, this stuff, you just have to memorize it. It's just repetition and getting it in and knowing uh, they, the, the device was flashed with ultraviolet light. Oh, that's EEPROM. Or it was electrically flashed, EEPROM. Okay. All right. Uh, flash memory, USB drives, it's the easiest thing. So this is a specific type of EEPROM, right? So if we're going to go back here, we're looking at flashing this 
electrically. Okay. Specific type, so larger chunks, faster, but slower than uh, the, than magnetic drives. So your SD cards, your thumb drives, things like that. Uh, yeah, security nightmare. How is it? How do you track it? Right. Got to do what you got to do, I guess. Lock it down with uh, uh, group policies or with some sort of endpoint protection. And it goes to my dogs. The joys of doing this from home. All right, uh, data destruction. Deleting data or formatting a hard drive that is, is not considered viable, right? You can't just delete it. When you delete data, all it does is it just deletes that entry in the phone book as it were, right? The, the data is still there. It's just now saying, yeah, you can write over it. But if it hasn't been written over, you can pretty much you know, be able to uh, go in there and, and recover that data. So anything that's left over, remnant data, data remnants, I go in and I have, uh, you know, some confidential information on a thumb drive and I just delete it. I don't format uh, or wipe the drive, I should say. It's a good chance that you could go in and, and actually collect that information if I don't overwrite it in an in a appropriate method. Uh, there's a lot of recovery tools. Um, you know, that's a, a uh, uh, yeah, the data rescue center there. Uh, it's a forensic recovery unit. If they're working on your stuff, you've had a really, really bad day. So what you want to remember, data left over is remnant data or data remnants. Uh, there's a, rec uh, a uh, link there for some really cool tools. All right. So overwriting your data, shredding, wiping, it's going to remove the the data, it's going to overwrite it and remove the entry. Um, what it's going to do is go and write every single sector of the hard drive that you do. What you'll see here is the overwriting standards. Um, I don't remember if this is specifically listed on the test um, or if, it, if not, we'll have to look and double check on that one. But good, some really good references on that. Um, we'll say realistically, Overriding, uh, you know, one pass is enough. You know, they've said, oh, well, it was, we were able to recover some stuff in, uh, in a lab. It was like a fraction of some file in a lab, and then you're, you're going to be fine. Um, some tools, uh, you know, listed there. Windows built in Cypher command is a really nice free tool. Realistically, overriding it once is more than enough. Uh, don't, you don't need to do, you know, 20 rounds to overwrite it once is going to keep your, your, you've done your due diligence at that point. All right, degaussing. Uh, yeah, I don't know how many people are old enough to remember the old CRT monitors and you'd have to degauss them because they get all wonky. Well, it's integrity of a, the magnetic me media using a strong magnetic field. So what you're doing is actually physically destroying the hard drives doesn't work on uh, SSDs. So something to keep in mind there. Uh, physical destruction, this is, this is the most secure. Uh, if you ever get the opportunity to go to a facility that shreds uh, hard drives, I highly recommend it. It's very uh, entertaining to, do, to see and a little terrifying at the same time. Uh, but this is the most secure method. Uh, you know, you can send it off and shred it or pulverize it, get, make sure you get a certificate of destruction. Realistically, hammer to the spindle works. You know, I know uh, people that have taken uh, rifles, shotguns to the drives. You're just physically destroying the device in a way that it cannot be recovered. Uh, if you are going to do a third party, there, the NAID um, can give you a list of certified vendors and you'll get a certificate of destruction. Uh, you have to understand what's the difference on-site, off-site, if you're doing it on site, you still need to track that from a due diligence perspective. So who did it, who witnessed it, when was it done um, versus off site where they're going to give you a list of uh, a certificate of destruction that's typically going to have the, uh, the uh, uh, serial number of the device as well as the date and time it was destroyed. 
All right, so shredding this is where you think of uh, paper, right? Everyone's seen those secure bins. Strip cut versus cross cut. Strip cuts, uh, you can put those back together, right? It's gonna go strips of paper uh, down um, the entire length. Cross cut's gonna go more the, the uh, diamond uh, output. So it makes it a lot more difficult to put back together. If you're doing the strip cuts, right, you can start seeing those patterns. You can see a little bit easier um, what you're working with, bigger pieces as well. And then shredding is easy to audit. Hey, here's who picked it up and destroyed it, and we put our stuff in there. We're good to go. Uh, and, you know, it prevents dumpster diving. I know breaches, yeah, poor document disposal. Uh, I believe CVS was a big one um, several years ago. Got fined quite a bit of money. Because uh, they didn't train their staff to to put uh, sensitive information in the secure disposal, and people were able to someone was able to go in and pull a bunch of uh, healthcare information out of the dumpster. So make sure you have good processes in place. Honestly, at this point, I wouldn't even have a standard recycle bin. I would only do the secure recycling. They're gonna or secure shredding. They're gonna recycle that paper anyway, and it eliminates that um, that risk. All right. You're going to have to know the difference between certification and accreditation. Very similar, very different. So certification is validation that certain requirements have been met. We're going to say as the owner, I, I said you have to do A, B, and C. You have done A, uh, we've done A, B, and C. Then the owner comes back and says, I accept that you've done A, B, and C. So again, I need these features put into the next release. As, as the developer, I say, I have put these features, those features that you requested into the release. That's certifying that the, the requirements have been met. The owner would then say, check it and go, yes, you did do that. That's your accreditation. Hopefully that that one, that's one that I think trips uh, people up quite a bit. Oh. Let's see, hang on. I just had a bunch of messages pop up. Slow it down. Okay. Apologize. It is a little difficult to uh, to tell uh, where how people are going, uh, uh, not being able to see this, see anyone um, in person. So I will slow that down just a little bit there. All right, so again, ideal world, you'd have certification and accreditation for every uh, production deployment. You need to know PCI DSS. This is only gonna to apply to your card data environment. Scope is critical here. If you can segment your uh, card data environment, it's going to be a lot easier for you. If you have a flat network where all, everything is on the same, uh, you know, VLAN or, or network segment, your everything is now in scope, right? So, what do you need to know about PCI, PCI DSS? This is around uh, collecting card data environment, and I should have updated that release. They just came out with a new one. Um, in the last couple months so i will we'll make sure we get that updated before we send it out uh, that link does take you to the correct uh, version i just have the wrong version listed on there so core principles we got to have a secure network and systems we must protect cardholder data got to have a vulnerability management program so we've got to be patching things um, our access control measures so that's going back to the owners and and um, uh, classification and who can access things and who what's your process around granting access and tracking those things uh, monitoring and testing your network so you have to do you know vulnerability scans or pin tests uh, on an annual basis with some network segmentation testing and you have to have an information security policy uh, you probably heard about you know target home depot i mean it just keeps going on and on uh, for this so one thing to remember, PCI DSS, you can be compliant with that. That doesn't mean uh, that you're protected. All right, Octave. This was developed by Carnegie Mellon. Um, really what this is supposed to be is how do you kind of manage risk? Um, 
So OPTIC stands for that Operationally Critical Threat Asset and Vulnerability Evaluation. So how are you managing your risk? Uh, three phases. One, what's our staff's knowledge? What are our assets? And what are our threats? Document those things. Now, once you've done that, we're gonna identify any vulnerabilities and evaluate our controls, safeguards. What do we have in place? So once I know everything that I have, what are the threats to those things? I now wanna look and see what are my vulnerabilities and what do I have in place uh, to mitigate those, um, it, it, those threats and vulnerabilities that I've identified. Then once we get through that, I wanna do a risk analysis. Where are my gaps? And put together a risk mitigation strategy. So uh, for the exam, what you see on this slide should be enough. Again, you're going to need to know this and they know is, you know, what's on here, but um, pretty high level. Uh, you should be, should be good to go on that. All right. Uh, so ISO 17, 17, 799 and 27,000 series. Absolutely. We'll need to know these. Um, these are really, so International Organization for Standards, ISO, comes from the, uh, the British standard, the BS 7799, renamed to 27001, aligning with the 27000 series of standards. So what you'll need to know for the exam on this one, what was the standard that uh, uh, derived from the British standard 7, 7799, ISO 27001? That's kind of what you need to know. Um, you don't need to know what's in the full uh, uh, standard, just what it is. Uh, there's a ton of those standards. The main ones, these are the ones you'll probably want to know uh, for the exam. Uh, 27001 is your uh, security techniques. So that's the one um, It's going to give you that, that higher level uh, guidance there. Then 27002 is how you actually do what 27001 says. 27005, how do you do your risk management process? And then 27799 is uh, healthcare uh, using 27002. So what do you need to know on this slide? ISO 27001 derived from BS 7799. There you go. That's the main part. Uh, then 27001 is your your guidelines right here's the things we're going to be audited against or we can be certified against 27002 is how should we be doing the things that 27001 says uh, then you'll need to know you know 27005 is risk management and 27799 health uh, security management in health so again you don't need to know what's what does 27002 actually say? What are the controls? What are the different uh, sections? That's not important here. Uh, you just need to know what it, the overarching, what's the point of it? Thing to remember for the exam, you know, everybody says it's a, a mile wide and an inch deep. And I'd say it's a little deeper than that, but you don't need to know a, a lot of deep knowledge. You just need to know a little bit about a lot of things. So in the book, um, it does mention 27,002, uh, 2005. The newest one is 2013. There's really, uh, that, just know that 27,002, 2013 is the latest. 27,001, 2013 is kind of the most recent main release. They had a release in 2017, but it was mostly cosmetic. So uh, I wouldn't really be too concerned about that didn't really change what it's looking for there. All right. COVID, uh, this is out of ISACA. So the same people that do the CISM, CISA, um, some of those other certifications, uh, control objectives for information and related technology. This is really more focused on IT, not security, information security as a whole. Um, but you'll need to know uh, 34 information technology processes across four domains. They're going to say, what is the um, control framework that has 34 information technology processes across four domains? You need to know that that's COVID. Or what are those four domains? They're going to give you, uh, you know, a list and say, here, which one is correct? 
You'll just need to know and memorize what they are. You don't need to, again, don't need to know what's actually in plan and organized. That's not relevant to the exam. What they want you to know is which one of these does what uh, at a high level. Um, ITIL, again, IT service management, it's kind of best practices. I think uh, V4 is now out, I believe. I, can, I got mine on V3 a couple years ago. Um, it's just, how do you manage your IT program? Uh, you'll need to know that there's five uh, practices uh, for the core guidance. So those are the five. You'll need to know what those are, memorize them. Um, and keep, that's it. You don't need to know what does service strategy actually mean? What is goes into service strategy? That, that's not as important as knowing here are the five for ITIL. All right, NIST CSF. Again, what it says there, probably not testable. Probably one of the more uh, adopted ones we see. ISO 27001 uh, internationally in the US, NIST CSF seems to be uh, uh, one of the main ones. Uh, but t definitely one of those two is typically uh, what we see uh, companies adopting as their control framework. Um, so result of the executive order, probably want to know that. We're gaining in popularity. It's comprised of the five functions. You need to know that. Um, and then a lot of major frameworks and standards are represented. So it is the framework of a bunch of the other standards and the other frameworks. It kind of takes a little bit of the best of, of all of them. A um, little, more, little more business friendly than, say, the next one we're going to go through, uh, NIST 853. So NIST CSF, uh, you need to know that. Understand it's, a, it's a, uh, comprised of, uh, you know, those five functions and made up of the different standards and frameworks. It's voluntary. There you go. Okay, so uh, NIST 853, not in the book yet. I don't know if it's going to be in the exam. Um, we'll cover it a little bit more, but really what this is is FISMA. You'll need to know if you see 853 FISMA. Uh, DFARS is the other acronym, D-F-A-R-S. Um, looks like the new, and this won't be testable. I, I, would, I can't imagine. There's no way. CMMC. Uh, for the U.S. government is going to be uh, a lot of NIST 853 references there. So you'll just want to know 853 government, uh, very uh, uh, prescriptive, uh, very reg regimented. So really focused on like government subcontractors, government uh, entities. FIPS 189 and FIPS 200 is how you classify the data. Um, and then 860, we'll, we'll talk about all this later. This as far as I know, is not in the exam. All right, so now we're going to talk about protecting data in motion, data at rest, uh, encryption, physical security. Very important rule of thumb. Number one, if I cannot be assured something is physically secure, I need to consider encryption. If I don't know that somebody's not going to steal a laptop or whatever it may be, I really need to encrypt that data. That, that's the only way to know that you have protected your data. Uh, data in transit, as it's moving from place to place, am I physically protecting the entire environment? Is it gonna go outside of my environment to something I don't manage? I need to consider encryption. You know, do I have physical security? Do I have, uh, could somebody plug into my network and see information? If, they, if that's a reality, yeah, we need to consider encryption. Same thing, data at rest. How do, when it's not in use, right, or being moved, if I can't ensure that physical security of it, I need to encrypt it. It's, you know, uh, backups going off site, uh, you know, laptops left in the backseat of a car, right? At the end of the day, encryption, Absolutely your friend. Encrypt everything you can if you cannot ensure that nobody can physically take that or get to it that shouldn't get to it. All right, so I'm gonna give a second here for some questions and make sure uh, I'm gonna pull up the, this and see if there's any uh, questions on uh, any of the chats so far. 
see, I do not see anything from the moderator team. So if, if I don't hear anything here in a second, I am going to move uh, forward with this. All right. Now we get to the exciting stuff, in case everybody was wondering. Come on, there we go. Easy. All right. This is a really long chapter. Um, we're actually going to take three classes, so we'll cover the uh, first little bit here tonight. Uh, Ryan will continue the class on Thursday or Wednesday, I apologize, Wednesday. And then Evan will finish it up next Wednesday. Uh, we do have a break on Monday. So it gives people a chance to catch up and have questions. All right, so domain three, security engineering. This used to be three separate domains. When they did that realignment, they took security architecture, cryptography, and physical security, put it into one monster domain. All right, terms and definitions to memorize. Well, got to know these things. You're going to have to know every single one of these things on here and know what they are without question. All right, so security models. This is going to define what subjects and objects can do, right? So the subject being the, the um, keep it simple. Subject is a user, object is a resource. So it's, it, again, like I said, it's managing that relationship we're going to need to understand what's the difference between read up, read down, write up, write down. So in this example, we're going to go through these a, a bit more, but when, if it, we have a secret object, the subject, your person can read down. I'm a top secret clearance. I can read down below me. I can read the secret level. Secret flows up to top secret. Um, that's one version and then secret subject. So I have a secret clearance. I can actually write up to top secret, but I can't read it. So we're going to go through this here in a little bit uh, more detail. All right. You will need to know the different security models. Just again, not an easy, there's no real easy, quick way to remember this. Um, well, there are some tricks, but not a whole lot. The, you just need to know the difference. Discretionary access control, know that that's in uh, TCSEC, the orange book. We're going to talk about that more here in a minute. But we're going to restrict access to objects based on the identity of the subjects and the groups they belong. And then uh, you can pass that permission on to another subject. Mostly in the government, you're going to see this. I don't know if I've seen it um, in the, the private sector. Uh, mandatory access control. So the operating system constrains the ability of the subject to access or perform some sort of an operation. Authorization is enforced by the operating system kernel and it's centrally managed by a security policy administrator. That last one is key. It's kind of the trick. I think um, it, mandatory, it's going to be uh, enforced by the operating system and it's centrally controlled. Kind of the easy way to remember that. Discretionary is your orange book. Rule-based, um, yeah, access allowed or denied to objects based on a set of rules, ACLs, firewalls. That may be a good way to remember that one. And then role-based or non-discretionary access control. Um, so knowing that it's uh, permissions to a particular rule. There you go. I, again, not a lot of tips or tricks on this. You just have to memorize and know what are the different characteristics of these models. What they're going to ask you is uh, they're going to give you a scenario and describe one of these um, these four models. And you need to know what are those characteristics of each of these so you can pick the correct one. All right. So. So where it gets super exciting, and I was looking at what my uh, content was for the uh, that when Evan put this out, and I was like, oh great, this is gonna be a good one. And then I realized that they moved security models under this, and I got it. And honestly, for the the most part, you're just gonna have to memorize these things. Um, a lot of them you, you probably won't ever see, 
but you have to know them. Uh, I think what you're going to see is a lot of this is uh, they, they do a lot of historical type of information uh, to understand how we got to where we're at. So even though there's things in here that maybe, and especially encryption, we're going to see it more, uh, that you're not going to see in, in uh, the real world, you need to understand it because everything we're doing from a security perspective has built off of those other things. So we want to build that, that base of knowledge to understand where we've come from. So we're going to go through all of these uh, here. So uh, state machine, we're going to capture it and verify the security of the system. Um, what are the current permissions, the current instances of subjects accessing objects, uh, and if the subject can access the object, is it correct? Right. So if we we capture that the current state and validate that it is meeting what the documented state would be, then we're secure. Um, always secure, no matter what state it's in. So finite state, state transition, secure state machine. Uh, don't remember anything specific about those on the exam. Uh, just know that those are part of the state machine model. Uh, and then it really is kind of the basis of everything else. Oh boy, the exciting stuff, Bell Lapadula. So you'll need to know this was for the Department of Defense focused on confidentiality, Bell Lapadula confidentiality. So the way this works, I've got hair in my mouth, excuse me. Um, Simple security, you can't read up. If I have a confidential level um, clearance, I cannot read secret level information. I don't have permission to read that. The strong, or the, I'm sorry, the star uh, security property means I can't write down. So when you look at this, um, what are we wanting to do? Well, we want to, again, confidentiality, only who can have access to it, it's need to know, right? So I can't read up to something that I shouldn't be able to see. And then if I have that star property, I cannot write something at a, from a secret level down to confidential or unclassified, right? So I can't write data down below its classification and I can't read above what my classification is. That's kind of, that's the way we want to look at that. Um, too low, two rules, strong tranquility, meaning security labels will not change while it's in operation. And then weak, meaning they will not change in a way that conflicts with defined security properties. So we just need to know uh, Bella Padula confidentiality, meaning no read up. If you see the star property, you know, now it's no read up, no write down. And then they have a strong tranquility, weak tranquility, what those two things are. Memorize the all these slides. Nobody's gonna want to have me teach anymore because I just keep saying you got to memorize this stuff. Um, lattice based, so very complex. Uh, I think what you see here in this example is probably uh, pretty accurate. You've got maybe nuclear and, and crypto, so very two secret uh, or uh, uh, sensitive uh, types of things. So every relationship between a subject object, there's upper or lower limits. So what level do you have? Where can you go? Um, you have a least upper bound, greatest lower bound. Based on that, those two things are going to tell you what you have access to. There you go. So you have multi-level, multilateral security. Um, again, it's not going to give you a, uh, you know, how do you build one? How do you put this in place? It's going to give you these definitions, give you this example or uh, uh, scenarios you need to know, okay, lattice space, and maybe it says it's for very complex with the least upper bound, greatest lowest bound, lower bound, I should say. Which model is that? It's what you'll need to know uh, for the exam on that. You can absolutely read more. There's a lot out there, uh, but I figure, you know, you guys are having enough to memorize as it is. Okay, Biba came after Bill of Padula. Um, it's the opposite of Bell Lapadula. So Biba integrity. Remember, I uh, is for Biba integrity. So using the lattice of integrity levels, uh, single integrity, no read down. So I can't read anything below my level. And the star is no write up. I can't write above what I should say or uh, uh, what I can see, what I can read. Uh, so just remember. Biba is integrity, 
and it's the opposite of Velva Padula. And what they like to do is give you a scenario and it's either no read up, no read down, no write up, no write down. And you need to remember which is the difference. Velva Padula, no read up, no write down. It's confidentiality, Biba, integrity, no read down, no write up. All right, Clark Wilson, um, separation of duties, authorized access and modification only in an authorized manner. I think that's you know really the important part here. So this is an integrity model. Uh, you have to have access to objects via programs. Programs need to be limited to what they can and cannot do. You have a well-formed transaction. So can you enforce that user uh, in control over the app? Um, yeah, I can't talk. Ability to enforce the control over applications. So you have that access control triple. You got to remember the user, the transformation procedure. So what is your well formed? And then the constricted, constrained data item. And then you have an integrity verification procedure. So uh, that's what makes up that well formed transaction. You just need to know uh, for the exam what is Clark Wilson? Well, that's an integrity model. Uh, subjects are accessing objects via programs. Those are the, those are kind of the key words you're going to see in the scenario. Uh, and then they're going to say, you know, they'll give you a big paragraph, say which model is this. You see access objects via programs with well-formed transactions and their separation of duties. Okay, that's really the, the level of, of this that you need to know. You can absolutely go deeper if you want. I know personally when I took the exam, I went far deeper onto this stuff and probably spent way more brain cells trying to figure this stuff out than I, it really was required for the exam. Uh, information flow. Uh, so think of your data in individual discrete compartments. So how is the uh, um, data being um, classified, right? Or I'm sorry, the, the two factors. So classification need to know the subject clearance has to be above the object classification. So you have to be top secret uh, clearance to secret classification. And their profile must contain one of the, the categories listed in the object label enforcing need to know. So just because I have top secret clearance doesn't mean I can see all secret data, right? So think of that as going and saying, yeah, I've got top secret clearance, but only in Minnesota. So I can only see top secret information in Minnesota. I couldn't see it in Virginia, or Florida, Texas, right? So what our classific our clearance has to be higher than the classification. And I have to have a category listed in the object labels is so it enforces uh, need to know. Brewer Nash is the Chinese wall. Uh, you will see it both ways. Avoiding conflict of interest. So really this came about um, for consultants within banking and financial, right? So you'll see this with um, financial audits. Uh, you can't have the same person auditing that's doing the actual work, right? You can't grade your own homework. So what you need to know for Brewer Nash, avoiding conflict of interest, um, what can be what can happen you can change those controls depending on what the person does if a, so the bit, that third bullet point really kind of sums it up you can write to an object you can write to an object if and only if you can't read another object is in a different data set so uh conflict of interest think of this as your uh uh you know consultants within banking doing those financial audits want to make sure that we're not uh you know grading our own homework as i said all right, uh, moderators, any notes on the chat on the speed? If, is that going a little bit better? This is definitely a different experience, I'm not going to lie. It's a lot easier to do this with people in front of you, not just a computer screen. All right, uh, non-interference models. Uh, making sure that actions that take place at a higher level do not affect or interfere with those at a lower level. Don't really care about the flow of the data, but what does the subject know about the state of the system? Um, and in, uh, 
addresses the inference attack. So I think we'll go through some um, examples in the uh, test questions we do, but say you have a system uh, that is for you know, shipping, right? And you got two competitors in it, and one of the competitors says, I want to ship, you know, a thousand widgets to the US. And the other competitor, or the other company is trying to figure out what they're doing. So maybe they try and ship the same thing. One that says, oh, no, we're good. We don't, we don't need anything, right? We've got that order filled. Now you can kind of start to figure out what the other person may, uh, may be doing. Um, covert channel, hiding a uh, policy violation hidden from the system owner. So some sort of a, maybe data transfer, data leak that is not through um, the main lines, it's hidden in some way. And we're gonna cover uh, some of this stuff a little bit more uh, as we go. All right. Take grant, uh, rules governing subjects and objects and permission subjects can grant to other subjects. So this is really important. You're gonna need to know um, in the third bullet point, those four uh, actions, you're going to need to know what those are, uh, and they will test you on it. Uh, or at least I had to, I know I had questions on those types of things. So every instance, something is going to um, be taken or granted. So taking the rule, uh, take rule says, I'm going to take the rights from another, of another object. Um, so granting means I'm going to grant the rights to another object. That's pretty straightforward, right? I'm either taking rights away um, or I'm going to grant rights to the object. Creating a rule or create rule allows the subject to create new objects and a remove allows you to remove rights it has over another object. So again, just understand those four bullet points, take grant, it has to, every instance of the model, one of those two things is gonna happen. Um, and you just need to know what those four um, rules are for it. Again, it's not gonna go super in depth on those, uh, but they're gonna give you scenarios and you're gonna need to know, oh, it's a uh, create, um, you know, what is what model is, allows you to create uh, new objects, right? All right. And we have the access control matrix. Now this probably looks a little bit more familiar to most, pe most people, uh, OS applications. So it's a table defining access permissions between subjects and objects. So subjects being your users, uh, objects being the different files. So what can they do? Simple, this one is the one I think most people get um, pretty quickly because it's what we see and um, what we work through uh, typically in IT on a daily basis, Active Directory. Uh, you know, is a good way to, to think of that one. All right, the Zachman framework for enterprise architecture, which is six frameworks for providing information security, asking what, how, where, who, when, and why. Uh, I've never actually seen this in use anywhere. Uh, I think what you would want to know for this one is that you know, what framework asks who, what, where, when, and why, and how. If you see that, that's your Zachman framework. Uh, you can look through the, the different um, things on the table there, gives you some good examples. Again, I, I've never seen it. I didn't have anything on it. I haven't, I haven't heard of anybody having this, but we want to know what it is. Again, going back through the history of where we, how we got to where we're at. Graham Denning, guess what I'm gonna say here? Memorize this slide, shocking, I know. Uh, so basic rights in terms of commands. So you have the three parts, and then you have, so you have your objects, your subjects, and your rules, and you need to know the eight rules. So you're gonna grant rules, or I'm sorry, uh, use this to grant subjects, a whatever, to objects, right? So I'm either gonna transfer, grant, delete, read, create, whatever that is. So what you're going to need to know is unfortunately memorizing R1 through R8, knowing what those are, and that if you see something with three parts around objects, subjects, and rules, it's Graham Denning, memorize the rules and understand what they are. OK, 
because there are other, uh, we're going to go through more that have other rules. So you're going to have to know which rule set or which set of uh, letters, number combinations go with which security model. All right. So modes of operation, four types, dedicated, one classification for all objects in the system. Everything in that system is top secret. Everything in this system is secret. It doesn't matter. We got one classification for every object in the system. In order to access that, you have to be a clearance equal or greater than the system level. So if everything in that system is top secret and I've got secret, I'm not getting in. If everything in the system is secret and I've got top secret, then I can have access to the system. Then we're going to add on top of that, you have to have the appropriate clearance, right? So secret, top secret, whatever it may be. Um, we have to have a access approval and a need to know for all objects in the system. So in order to even have access to the system to begin with, do I, am I even at the right clearance? Yes. Great. Now I need to go to uh, the uh, get a formal approval. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then once we have formal approval, I need to be able, I need to ha know for everything in the system. So, all right. Uh, so against uh, across this system access control system high, this is going to contain a mix of uh, you know of labels, right? So secret, top secret, public, whatever they are, right? You're going to have whatever your different uh, classifications are in order to have access to that system i have to have a clearance equal to or greater than the highest object label okay so if it if the highest level is secret and i'm secret i'm good if the highest level is top secret and i'm secret not going to work and the best part about all of this is uh you know reality is you probably won't see this um you know, maybe in some sort of in some government maybe but in private sector i don't think the you see this stuff very often i know i personally have never seen it all right compartmented objects are placed into compartments you have to have a formal need to know to access the data in a compartment and this has got to be that system enforced way so uh you'll need to know signing an nda for all the information on the system even though you're only accessing some uh, compartment of it, right? You still have an NDA for the entire system. You have to have a clearance for all information on the system, and then have to have access for or, um, uh, approval for some of the objects, and a valid need to know for some of the objects. So even though you're only going to be accessing some of them, you have to sign an NDA for all, and you have to uh, have clearance uh, for the highest level. Also, I'm going to say I don't know what I did to Evan to make him make me go through this one, but that's okay. Um, I'm just kidding, Evan. All right, multi-level objects, varying levels. Or I'm sorry, labels and varying clearances. There, you need to know reference monitor, um, mediating access between subjects and ob objects. If you see reference monitor, multi-level, that's your trigger right there. Uh, same thing, signed NDA for all information, clearance for some of the information, access for uh, formal access approval for some objects, and valid need to know for some. So you might have, um, you know, low, medium, high, secret, top secret, whatever. I just need to have access or clearance level that is equal to some information label that is on that system, and then having uh, formal access approval for for that and having a valid need to know. Stay with us. It does get better. All right. TSEC or TCSEC Orange Book. So part of this is part of the uh, Rainbow Series. You're going to see that here in a second. Uh, you will need to know 1983 Rainbow Series first evaluation framework. Um, yeah. Uh, you don't need to know what's in it, just that it's a... Uh, uh, developed by the NCSC in 1983, Valuation Framework. Um, there's the Rainbow Series. Okay. 
All right, now the exciting part. You will need to know all of this stuff and understand what it means. So they're gonna say uh, and give you a, a, a description, a big paragraph and then say, this needs uh, controlled access protection. And then you'll have uh, the questions will be, you know, A1, B2, C1, right? Or uh, the other thing you would see in some of these is going to say, you know, which is the highest level of protection, right? And you need to know what they are. So D is the lowest, A is the highest. Understand what do the different levels mean. Uh, just, again, memorize this slide. This, this chapter is a ton of memorization. And as soon as you pass the exam, uh, it just immediately is wiped from your memory. All right, uh, trusted network interpretation, the red book. So think of the, it's the orange book for network systems instead of uh, the, the risk management. So there you go. And if you really are you know, wanting to read more about it, you can access all the rainbow books there. There are pretty interesting. Uh, again, I don't think those are actually in use anymore, but Kind of more about the history of how we got to where we're at. Uh, ITSEC, so uh, extensively in Europe. So that's a trigger there or a, uh, a keyword there that you will want to know. Um, international evaluation criteria, uh, references to Orange Book added some uh, for functionality, effectiveness, and correctness. So what does that mean? It means this. So uh, what you have is E0, E6, E0 being, we don't have really anything, E6 being a formal model, um, similar uh, you know, to the way that um, uh, the TCSEC equivalent ratings. So you'll need to know what is, you know, what does this actually mean? Well, memorize the order on this, uh, understand that uh, high integrity requirements that the, you know, what are the different levels? Um, uh, you know, gosh, think of going back to the orange book and then understanding that it's going to be adding, let me go back, you know, the functionality, effectiveness, and correctness, F, Q, and E. So, um, same thing, right? So you've got a functionality level and an E level, um, and yeah. Gosh, I don't remember seeing this on here, but uh, you'll want to know what's the difference between the orange book and this book. Uh, the levels here, the C1, C2, B1, B2, those are all going to be the same as the orange book. International common criteria, uh, internationally agreed upon standard for describing and testing the security of IT products. So. I know you're going to be stunned to hear this, but you will absolutely need to memorize and know the things in orange on uh, this page. What it's trying to do is get rid of vulnerabilities of the target for testing, right? So target of evaluation, what are we testing? What are we evaluating? Um, the security target, so the documentation describing the target of evaluation. What the protection profile, so what are the requirements and objectives um, for those systems, and the evaluation assurance level. So what did what did the tested system score? Um, and what does that look like? Same thing here. You're gonna need to memorize these. They're gonna say this happened, what level is it? Right? Um EAL1, functionally tested, structurally tested, methodically tested and checked, design, design tested and reviewed. What You don't necessarily need to know exactly what those things mean, uh, but what you're going to see is that they are going to um, uh, give you a, in the paragraph the keywords on there that say, you know, this, this must be similarly formally designed and tested or, you know, whatever it is, you're going to need to know what level that corresponds with. That's really the critical thing there. Um, yeah. All right. Wow. I really flew through that. This is, I apologize if I went way too fast for people. Um, 
I'm going to give this a chance to open up because we did cover some really dry, dry stuff. Um, and I'm going to look at, uh, let's see, look at the chat here. So if you guys have questions, let's go through some questions here. Um, I, I know I went through this stuff really fast. There's a lot of memorization. Unfortunately, you know, for, for a lot of this stuff, there is no easy way uh, to, to do it other than just going and reading it and memorizing it. Um, all right. Let's see. Watching the chat here come through, see if there's any questions. Moderators, if you have any, if you don't mind posting them to Teams uh, since I'm well behind on the chat. Uh, Maybe I should have saved the, uh, the crying gift for the end of this uh, this slide here. Let's see. It is also really difficult to do this in. Uh, without people, uh, the last three years we did it. You, you know, we at least we had a class. Um, And you know you can you can see people uh, kind of starting to like, huh? What? So apologize if I uh, went through that too fast. Let's see. Ryan apparently uh, Cola is is uh, telling me to go over the models again. He hates me. That's a lot to go over again. No, uh, if that's what we want to do, I can absolutely do that again. Um, did anybody have, if there's any specific questions, let's see. Uh, in here, let's see, ask a question, question was answered. I will make sure that I uh, that I go through this. Uh, make sure we go through the next one a little bit slower. Uh, CAD testing is doing processes, not memorizing terms. No, what the CAD test is, what the test is going to do is make sure you understand the, the concepts and the, the information um, within uh, these different d domains. So once you show, like, if we go through this. And it comes up with a scenario and uh, asking around the different uh, security models. Uh, and you're able to show that you do know the difference in the different models. Uh, that's, that's really uh, where you're going to, what, what they're looking for, right? Do you have a, a grasp and a, and a mastery of the information? Um, you know, the biggest thing on this, again, just is repetition. I went through this. Uh, I went through the Sean Harris book, the entire book, uh, cover to cover, making notes. I probably did three legal pads of notes. I uh, didn't have the uh, resources to understand what I should do. Uh, then I read the um, Eric Conrad book, and then I did you know about 4,000 test questions on CC Cure. Uh, repetition is absolutely the key. Um, let's go back. Let's see. I am going to go through. I want to make sure. Uh, the two I think that people kind of get confused with, I'm going to go through Bella Padula and Biba again. Uh, that's a good point there, Evan. Um, so we want to be able to tell the difference uh, of these two. So when we're looking at this, what's going to happen is they're going to give you um, a scenario and they'll say, maybe it's an example where, uh, you know, Joe cannot read up and Bob cannot write down, right? So why are we maintaining the confidentiality? Again, I cannot have access to information that is classified above my security clearance. At the same time, I want to say, make sure um, that from a confidentiality perspective, I'm not writing down data to a, low, low, to a level lower than its clearance. 
So if a document has, has been labeled as top secret, it can only be put into the top secret um, bucket, right? I can't write a top secret document to confidential or unclassified. So that's what we want to make sure is confidentiality, right? Who it's need to know who can access this. Only the people that we say can access it can access it. How do we prevent that from ha or uh, ensure that happens? Again, I can't read above my clearance level, and I can't write below my clearance level. Same time, Biba, exact opposite. I want to maintain the integrity of it. So I can't read down. I can't read things that are below my clearance. And I can't write things up. So if I'm at a top secret, I'm going to level, or I cannot read anything below top secret. So I'm passing information up. I'm not reading things at a lower uh, uh, level, right? So really, if you see something and you, you know, they maybe they say read up, write down, you and you just are like struggling to understand. Uh, and figure out which is the correct one. Look for integrity or confidentiality, right? Biba, I in, in the name is your integrity model. Uh, Bella Padula is your confidentiality. Um, yeah, Evan has a great point in the chat. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably never see Biba, Bella Padula. Uh, you know, these are, you know, in theory or government. Right, mandatory access controls. So we're teaching things that in this on these models that nobody's really ever seen, uh, never will see. So it's a very different um, thought process. Um, so let's see. So yeah, uh, Clark Wilson. Uh, integrity. Make sure that you have um, authorized access and modification only in an authorized manner. Right? That's really the, the important thing on that one. Uh, information flow compartmentalized. Again, I have to have a clearance higher than the classification and I need to be, uh, I have to be listed on one of the categories in the object label. So when you're looking at that, that what you're seeing on these screens, again, I know this is really dry stuff. I know this is really hard to go through. Uh, it, this is kind of, you know, this is the history of where we came from. Unfortunately, a lot of this, you just, you have to just memorize. There's not, you know, like we'll get to some of the other stuff with encryption and some of that, there's some tips and tricks and easier ways to uh, remember it. This, these security models is, you know, in my my experience, this is just memorization and understanding the difference in these. Read through it. Um, you know, we're gonna have a uh, a um, off day uh, next Monday. Um, you know, if you're reading through this stuff and you have questions, post it to the group. We'll we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, use this as a chance to get caught up. I know this is a lot to go through. We're gonna go through a lot more uh, on Wednesday. So. Uh, Brewer Nash, Chinese Wall. We are making sure that uh, uh, users are uh, cannot, you know, access multiple uh, conflict of interest categories. So Brewer Nash, Chinese Wall, conflict of interest. We're trying to prevent that non-interference. So an inference attack. Again, I'm going to be able to put together. I'm going to guess information uh, that I don't have maybe the clearance level or authority to know. So by getting different pieces of information or the lack of information, uh, I will be able to put together a picture of what's going on to, at a level that uh, I shouldn't be able to do. Uh, covert channel, again, hidden from the system owner. We're going to cover covert channels uh, more later as well, but that's what you want to know on that one. Uh, the Tate Grant, again, when we look at this one, two rights. We're going to either take or grant. We're going to take something away or give something uh, to the subject um, or object. Uh, understand those four rules, 
right? Knowing that a subject can take the rights of an object, uh, you can grant uh, their own rights to another object, or we can create a new object, or we can remove a rule, remove rights from an object. And access control matrix, uh, like I said, I think this is the one that most people get. They're like, oh yeah, I've seen this before. It's just a list, a table that says what can the different people or the different subjects do to the different objects. Uh, Zachman framework, six frameworks, who, what, why, where, when, and how. That's what you need to know. Again, I don't think I've ever seen this in, used anywhere. Um, first time I'd ever heard of it was during the uh, my studying. And then, um, you know, every year when we get back to this, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that one because nobody ever uses it in the real world. Uh, Graham Denning, so you'll want to make sure you understand um, three three parts, right? So you got objects, subjects, and rules with those eight rules. So in the exam, you might see, again, what are what is, what is a security model that has eight rules focused on subjects, objects, and rule, uh, focused on subjects and objects, right? You need to know that's Graham Denning. So it's going to tell you what can the subject due to the object, and it's based on one of those eight rules. Yeah, I think uh, I saw somebody in the chat there memorizing it, write it down. Absolutely was the way to work for me. Um, just write down Graham Denning, subject, our object, subjects, and rules, R1, this, R2, this. So go through, um, go through that, Let's see. See. Everybody on there, let's see. B uh, Biba, Bella Padula, we got through that again. All my chats just want, came through all, all at once there for our uh, internal chat there. All right. We're gonna go through we'll go through these again. Make sure everybody got them. Uh, I realized that I went pretty quick. It, again, it's really it is it's a lot more difficult to uh, to pace yourself uh, when you can't see people uh, falling asleep as you're talking about this stuff. And I, trust me, as dry as it is, um, uh, to listen to it's not much more fun um, to to go through. All right, so uh, modes of operation. So dedicated. We got one label for everything, right? Everything on this system is secret. Um, when you do this, uh, the subject, right? So the so every every piece of data on that system is secret, and I want access to it, and I only have confidential clearance. I can't get to it, right? If I have secret clearance, top secret clearance, absolutely, we can get to it, um, and so. In order to get to it, I have to have the right level of clearance. Again, I have had to have had a formal approval that I can get to it. And then uh, I need to have a need to know uh, for all objects on that system. Right. So this is really uh, very strict, right? All right. Hang on. I just had a whole bunch of new chat things come through. I apologize. Let's see. Another joke. Um, I'll, I'll use the one I used at our internal uh, all company meeting. I think that one went over well. How do you know when a joke uh, has become a dad joke? When it, when it's become a parent? All right, I know this is this is painful to go through. I apologize. Uh, all right, so there you go. There's your joke. Hopefully everybody liked that or at least groaned. We'll see who's actually still awake by the uh, the boo comments in the chat there all right uh system high so you're gonna have mixed labels right you can it's not just only one um, classification and you have to have equal or greater than the highest object on that system so again secret top secret and i have confidential no go secret top secret secret confidence uh clearance no go i'd have to have whatever is the highest level of uh 
classification on that system, I have to be uh, have that level of clearance. Uh, compartmented, so you know you're going to have compartments, different levels of um, uh, uh, classific or, uh, classification, and I have to sign an NDA for everything, and I have to have approval for some of it. I have to have need to know for some of those things on there. Let's see. Practice exam on the model. Um, I do not have any readily available. I know we will be going through a lot of this stuff uh, the last you know three or four classes. So we'll make sure we go through that. I don't have any questions right off the uh, top of my head. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, when you see a multi-level, um, you're gonna want what you're gonna be really looking for. This is a reference monitor. This is gonna that's your your keyword for that one. Uh, they will look at those types of things in the exam, saying, "Hey, which mo mode of operation utilizes a uh, uh, reference monitor?" So there's your your. Uh, your keyword there that, that tells you, oh, multi-level is reference monitor. Uh, so TSEC, or TCSEC, Orange Book, Rainbow Series, 1983, US government, big one there. There's the picture again. Uh, again, you're gonna wanna understand what the levels are on this. Um, just from my, again, my, my memory on this, you didn't need to know what does structured protection actually mean? What does security domains actually mean? Uh, they're going to give you an example that'll tell you that, and you need to know that if it, if it needs structure protection, that's B2, right? So that's what you're going to need to know on um, on this one. Let's see. Oh, our. Uh, <laughs> Director of Sales just sent me a, another joke here. So, did you know French fries weren't actually cooked in France? They were cooked in Greece. There you go. That's for you, Drew. Um, trying to keep it going, uh, keep everyone awake with some some jokes there. Uh, so, Orange Book, Red Book, network, right? That's what you need to know about the the Red Book. ITSEC is going to be using the same uh, levels as the orange book, but adds those three uh, additional um, uh, areas there, the functionality, effectiveness, and correctiveness. So E0, uh, E6. So it'll tell you um, what those what, what that looks like right here. So uh, the C1 through B3, right? Understand when you see these with the F dash, comma, colon, that's your IT sec. Again, you don't need to know exactly what the, what high integrity requirements for networks is. You just need to know if you see that it's part of IT sec. All right, uh, international common criteria, going through this again. Um, if you see these four uh, phrases in orange, that's the, you need to memorize those, right? So what is your target of evaluation? What's, what's being t evaluated, right? So we're gonna say, I'm gonna test this system using the security target, the documentation, right? So here's, I'm testing this system. Here's what it, it is. Our protection profile, what is our requirements for protection, protecting that target of evaluation? And then out of that, we get an assur evaluation assurance level. So. I'm going to define what my target or my system or product that I'm evaluating is. We'll grab that documentation describing it. What are we testing it against? What are the requirements we're testing against? And then how to do. Um, so what are those seven levels? Again, you're going to need to just know, is it functionally tested, structurally tested, right? If they're, when you see that that semi-formally designed and tested, semi-formally formally verified designed and tested, they're going to give you uh, the the clues in there to understand and say, oh, okay, I need to know that um, 
we've methodically designed, tested, and reviewed. What does that mean? You know, I, I'm not sure that, that you need to go into saying um, and really reading and memorizing the entire common criteria. You're just going to be able to need to know the difference of these. So when you read the through the, the test uh, and they say, uh, they'll give you the clues to, that you'll be able to say, oh, that's, I've tested and checked, but I haven't reviewed. Okay, well, that's E-L, E-A-L-3, right? Um, it's similarly formal, semi-formally designed and tested. Well, what level is that? EAL5, right? That's that's kind of the level of uh, detail I remember going through um, on the exam. And yeah, this is this is the probably the driest material uh, that I think we're going to cover. So if you've made it through this, this will be good, right? You've you've made it through the toughest uh, class. Some people don't like encryption. Some people don't like the uh, network piece because that's not what they do. To me, this stuff was the most painful to get through. So if you make it through this, you get to the next class, you know, I think you're, you're over the hump there. It, it only gets better. It's more, more interesting, it, you know, even with things like encryption where we're going to talk about, you know, cipher blockchain and what's the difference between uh, streaming and uh, all that. But that's kind of cool. This, this is really, really dry. All right, I'm going to check the... Uh, chat. All right. I don't see any other questions on there. Moderators, are we good on anything that I did not see? Anybody have any questions that uh, need to be addressed? Um, give that a second because I know there is a delay. All right. So we're going to continue from here Wednesday. Make sure you go back, reread chapters one through three. If you haven't already, you can start on four if you want. Um, come with questions on Wednesday. We're going to recap some of this stuff. We'll make Ryan go through uh, some of this stuff. Uh, and then we're going to do some test questions based on that. So same. Um, same thing we did with those, you know, eight or nine quiz questions tonight. We're going to do the same thing uh, every class just to keep track, make sure everybody's up to speed. Uh, reminder, we won't have class uh, next Monday, the 27th. It is our first break. So if anybody is behind, this will give you a chance to get caught up. Um, read through security models a couple more times. Uh, but yeah, if you have questions, post them on the, um, the chat we put together. Uh, in the message boards and uh, you know make sure that we have uh, a chance we'll give you you know be able to answer those as we go all right so with that um, I don't see any other questions so I'm gonna let this go here for uh, a little bit and see if there's any questions <clears throat> 